I'm your host, Aaron Heath. I can take a moment and thank you for downloading, subscribing, and most importantly, listening to episode number 43 of the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. You can find the show notes by going to gunrightsintexas.com slash 043. All right, it's time for another episode of the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. And on this episode, the gun of the show is the Taurus Public Defender. Now, one thing I like about this particular gun is the versatility that this gun features. The Public Defender is based on the Taurus Judge. It's just a small frame version, and it's kind of marketed towards a concealed carry market. Now, in my opinion, the Taurus Judge and the uh, some very similar Smith & Wesson Governor, as well as the Public Defender from Taurus, are all bad ideas for self-defense guns. Can they do the job? Yes. Are there better guns that can do the job? Yes. Now, there are those that will say, well, the public defender is the best gun or the judge is the best gun for self-defense because you can shoot shot shells as well as the standard 45 Colt. And, you know, they're right. It is versatile in that respect. But then there's the whole thing about the jack of all trades and master of none. And the public defender, like the Taurus judge, is a jack of all trades. It shoots shot shells and it shoots a uh, regular it shoots your regular 45 Colt ammo. Now, the thing about it is, it doesn't do either of them super well. It does them both well enough. Now then, I got mine because, well, I wanted a snake gun when I go hunting. Actually, I have a Taurus Judge as well, but when I bought them, I ended up buying a holster for a public defender instead of a judge. And then, I decided, well, rather than take the holster back, I'll get a gun that fits it. That's a stupid cheap holster. I, I wouldn't have lost much if I hadn't taken it back. It's not an Uncle Mike's holster, but it's like a, only a step ahead of that. But you know what? Let's go ahead and let's talk a little bit about the public defender. As I mentioned earlier, it is a smaller frame than the regular judge. Now, you know, Smith & Wesson, they kind of they kind of compete in the same market with their governor, except the governor has one more shot shell capacity or one more uh, round of capacity shot shell or 45 Colt. Plus, it also shoots the 45 auto. You could get the public defender and the Taurus judge to do the same, but you'd have to have a machine to accept moon clips. Well, I have I have to say that if I had to carry this gun as a defensive gun, it would do the job well enough. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying it's a bad gun. I'm saying that it's very limited in its purposes, and the purpose I use it for is when I go out hunting like Dove or I am uh, trudging around outside city limits at the junkyard. Well... It's a good gun to dispatch snakes with, and that's the whole point of carrying it. However, I've rambled long enough about the Taurus Judge. Let's just go ahead and go go talk about the specs on the gun. The model number is the 4510PD-3SS. No, this is not a Nazi gun. The SS stands for stainless steel because, well, the gun I've got is a stainless steel model. It does come avail it does come in the blue version as well. Don't get me wrong. I don't really have a preference one way or the other on these. The judge and the public defender both are chambered in 45 Colt and the 410 shot shell. It has a capacity of five rounds. It's a double action, single action gun. The front sight is a drift adjustable fiber optic sight, while the rear is basically a, uh, I would say it's a groove machine uh, into the slide, but there is a riser there that makes the sight work better. And but it is a bump in this uh it is a bump in the frame that's been machined with a groove. That's really how the only way to describe the rear sight. The material, stainless steel, the weight, it comes in at twenty eight point two ounces according to Taurus, and the MSRP as of January of twenty fifteen is six hundred fifty three dollars and thirty two cents. Now the MSRP is higher than the street price in most cases. However, keep in mind that this MSRP may not be the same as the MSRP when you, uh, well, when you go out and you buy the gun. This podcast will be available long after the time it's released. With that said, I think it's time to move on and let you know how to get the show. And before I do that, I want to make an announcement. I have finally got around to updating some of the audio clips that I run on the show. If you uh, like them or don't like them, let me know. However, I have updated the Get Show and the social media, social media clips. And if you want to know how to get in touch with me, that'll be later in the show. That's another audio clip. But first, let me run the new and improved Get Show audio clip.
The Gun Rights in Texas podcast is available on iTunes, on Stitcher, on Myro Player, YouTube, the website, and of course, in your favorite app using the RSS feed on the website. With all those options, there is no excuse for not subscribing. Links to all these can be found on every page of the website. All right. If you like that, let me know. If you don't like it, let me know. I like that a lot better than the old one, personally. Now, with that said, we do have some feedback from the listeners. Well, Stanley wrote in with a question about the various groups involved in politics in here in Texas, or at least the gun politics. He wrote in with, and this is going to be a quote, I know that the NRA, the TSRA, NAGR, OCT, Katie, OCTC, Texas Carry, Gun Rights Across America, Lone Star Gun Rights, and Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in America have all been involved in Texas politics in this session already. Which groups do you feel will see the most success improving Texas gun laws for gun owners and which are going to cause the most damage to the cause? Wow, that's a little bit of a complicated sentence there. Or more specifically, which are going to cause damage to the cause? Hmm. Well, the NRA and the TSRA are the ones that have traditionally made the most progress. NAGR is little more than Dudley Brown trying to pretend he is pro-gun while doing everything he can to hurt real pro-gun efforts. He will take credit for any uh, success that anybody has while throwing the blame at other people, most likely the NRA and their affiliates. OCT, Katie, Texas Carry, Gun Rights Across America, and Lone Star Gun Rights are all going to try to do more good than harm. But with the lack of experience they have, it will be interesting to see what they can get done. OCTC and MDA are the ones who will cause the most damage to our efforts. OCTC may have our best interest in their hearts and in their minds, but they are simply going about things the wrong way. I mean, they've already done a lot of damage. I mean, uh, there's, it's been over a week and they're still talking about uh, the stunt they pulled, you know, in all honesty. They have done more damage right now than MDA did uh, last year. It, not last year, but last session in Texas politics. I'm sorry, but that's the truth. And speaking of MDA, they're trying to do as much damage to gun rights as they can because, well, that's their job. That's what Bloomberg hired and uh, built them to do. I guess that pretty much answers as much as I can, Stanley. And we're going to move on. The gentleman with the handle, Polymer Pete G, wrote in. And he, well, basically, he wrote in with praise for Charles Cotton's interview in the last episode. And he wants to let people know he has actually burned copies of the episode onto CDs and given them to members of his local open carry chapters. He also gave copies to gun store employees and customers he ran into. Well, I have to say thanks, Pete. And by the way, that's a very interesting handle you have there. Polymer Pete. I guess he's a Glock or maybe an XD or maybe an M&P type guy. Now, Miranda Lawson, who is a frequent emailer to the podcast, wrote in to say she is spreading the word about OCTC and she hopes to get someone to talk some sense into Corey Watkins. (laughs) Yeah, right. She also wants to let listeners know that she is an on-again, off-again OCT fangirl that really likes this podcast. Okay. Well, I have to say thanks, Miranda, for the kind words because, well, the email, she didn't give me permission to quote it exactly, but she did indicate I could use it on the show. So I didn't quote it. I just paraphrased it. However, I'm going to say that, well, let me go back and rephrase that. I didn't paraphrase everything. Her exact words were, I am an on-again, off-again OCT fangirl, because I didn't read it exactly, I paraphrased it, but she did use the words OCT fangirl to describe herself. But anyways, thanks Miranda for the kind words and the effort. However, I really doubt that anything short of an arrest will get Corey Watkins to bring himself in line, and even an arrest will be a very brief thing while he's sitting in jail. I'm sorry, but that's really where Corey Watkins sits. He really thinks he's doing good, but, you know, when somebody thinks they're doing good by causing problems, they're mentally disconnected. I'm sorry. Well, time to move on, and, well, and let's just go ahead and do the social media clip, and if you like it, let us know. If you don't like it, well, let us know. The Gun Rights in Texas podcast has a social media presence. You can like it on Facebook, you can follow it on Twitter, you can circle it on Google+, and you can follow it on Instagram. With all those options, let's get social. 
Well, this episode, we're going to talk about a bill. We're going to talk about a bill that's currently sitting in the uh, Texas Senate. That would be SB 342, and we're going to give a quick analysis of it. SB 342 is the second unlicensed carry bill from Open Carry Texas and the National Association for Gun Rights. They had a big press uh, event for it, and then it was like the next week when they filed it. Now, this bill does have a few advantages over HB 195. First and foremost, it's not HB 195. That's right. It's not a companion bill to HB 195, even though it's supposed to be. That means that this bill is a different bill, and Corey Watkins hasn't had time to be actively pushing it. It lowers the penalty for 30-06 violations to a Class C misdemeanor. That's another advantage. But then we come to the disadvantages of this bill. And the disadvantages to this bill are really where we got to have a look. First and foremost, it's not a true companion bill to HB 195. As a result, OCT and their associates are now pushing two different bills in the legislature. There's ways to fix that. There are ways to fix that, but, you know, it's going to be hard to do. And the real problem comes in when you start looking at, well, how legislators are going to react to the bill. First and foremost, when they've been in there politicking, trying to get people to support HB 195, those people may feel like they're being tricked or deceived, especially if SB 342 becomes the bill that OCT champions over HB 195. Or if they take HB 195 and manage to get a committee replacement, where it's now where it becomes identical to SB 342, they really risk legislators feeling tricked or deceived, feeling like they've been tricked or deceived. If it was a true companion bill, it would help get the bill passed quicker because they could run in parallel through the houses. And then they could just simply go to conference committee to iron out any differences, but they're not really true companion bills. They are different bills, and even if they're both passed by both houses, they do have to go to a conference committee. And if they go to a conference committee, they go back to both houses to be reviewed for the changes, unless one house's version is taken over the other. Basically, because they have two different bills, they're going to be doubling their efforts for the same legislation because they're two entirely different bills. Another disadvantage the bill has is that it alters Texas Penal Code Section 30.06, or 30.06. One thing it does is it makes 30-06 apply both to open and concealed carry. And this is a problem we've had. It really is a problem. C.J. Grisham says, well, signs don't block the open carry of long guns. Because I had somebody email me uh, some, some of their enclosed groups things, but they do. Right now, signs do block the open carry of long guns. All you have to do is post a sign that says, no firearms permitted. And if somebody walks past that sign, they're guilty of violating Texas Penal Code Section 30.05. If C.J. Grisham is going in and he's telling legislators that this bill does the same thing or allows handguns to be treated the same way as rifles in Texas, he's lying, at least in regards to uh, criminal trespass. Right now, you do not have to have oral notification to tell somebody they cannot carry a long gun. You just have to have to give some kind of a written notification or a sign. Now, another change that this bill makes to 30.06 is that it requires oral notification to trigger criminal trespass. You can have a sign and oral notification, or you can have oral notification. And I'll guarantee you right now, the legislature, especially the House of Representatives, is not going to go for this. Why? Well, basically, Corey Watkins and company went into Pancho Navarro's office. They were asked to leave. They got aggressive. And now the House is really looking at panic buttons because of it. As soon as this bill goes out there, MDA and every gun banner that's involved in politics is going to take that video that Corey Watkins was so kind to provide them and put up on Facebook so they can share it for everybody. They're going to take that video and they'll say, this is why you cannot require oral notification to prevent trespass. So that'll get stripped out if the bill has any chance to go anywhere. And then you have the whole thing about property owners' rights. The legislature is real big on property owners' rights. Now, don't get me wrong. I, I really do think that this would be a positive thing if it was to pass, but it's not going to pass. Basically, you're telling property owners they cannot ban people unless they go confront them. And property owners are going to say, look, if I got somebody acting like Corey Watkins, 
I don't want to go near them, especially if I know they're armed. And I don't want them on my property if I know they're armed. And the legislature is going to sit there. They're going to listen to it. Yeah, your property rights would be violated if you had to go uh, tell them when before it was a sign that would block it. And then we have issues with the whole concept of oral notification. On the Texas CHL form, I'll throw a link in the show notes. A gentleman by the name of Clever Nickname posted uh, some issues, and I'll pull that up. Give me just a moment. But I'm going to pull that thread up so that we can discuss it. Now, Clever Nickname, I want to read his post. He posted, I'm guessing that the explanation might be since oral communication would require, and he's got in parentheses, the bill says either oral and written notification or or would be required. The, and then in parentheses, the bill says either oral and written notification or oral notification alone, close parentheses then it would be unlikely that a property owner would give oral notification to everyone who enters that carry is prohibited. The property owner would like to likely only tell people who were OCing because that would be a rather small number of people. CCWs, or CHLs is what that means, wouldn't be likely to be orally notified and then could still legally carry. I'm sorry, I added a few words here or there, but I have this problem just simply reading things. He goes on to say, although that does bring up an interesting question as to what oral communication is, even under current law. Penal Code Section 30.06C3 defines written communication, but I don't see a definition for oral communication. Does it include recorded audio, like what you're listening to right now, or only a live person giving oral notification or giving notification? I'm assuming that, for example, a periodic announcement over a PA system would probably count. But then you'd be getting into other issues like how often the announcement was made, how loud the volume on the PA is, and possibly even whether the announcement was also made in Spanish. After all, if somebody doesn't understand the language, they can't receive oral notification. And he added he edited it to add, also, I wonder what happens if a deaf person with a CHL is orally notified and they don't realize it. Anyways, we'll end it there because it gets into a little silliness, but however, he's got some good points there. You know, he brought up the delivery method as an issue. How would oral notification be delivered? Would somebody have to actually tell you that you're being notified or that carry is prohibited? Or could they announce it over a PA system with a recorded message or a person announcing every so often? And then you have the language used. What if you have somebody that doesn't speak English and your announcement's only in English? Were they effectively notified under the penal code? The judge would probably say, no, they couldn't understand what was said. So you, you uh, run the audio in Spanish and English. Then you have another problem. Here in, uh, here in Gaines County, we have a large Germanic Mennonite community. They speak uh, two different types of German. They like to call it high German and low German. High German is what... Eh, high German is when you say uh, somebody speaks German. That's what really what they consider high German. Low German is a variant that is rather complicated and... I really don't have time to explain the difference, especially if I want to make this a short episode for everybody. But what about those people? What if they went and they got a CHL, and now all of a sudden, they don't get, notif- they don't get notification, where before, statutorily, a sign in Spanish and English was sufficient. And then you have the verbiage issue, which Clever Nickname didn't bring up. The verbiage issue would be what qualifies as serving notice in lang- as far as verbiage. Somebody saying, well, you can't carry a gun in here. Well, that's obvious. You know, they've been notified. But what about somebody coming up? You can't have that in here. They're not telling you what you can't have. Are they talking about shirts, underwear? Maybe they're talking about a bracelet that's got an offensive message. Or maybe they take offense at a, uh, what's these charm bracelets that women like to carry now? Pandora bracelets? What if uh, they take offense at Pandora bracelets? Or do you think they're taking offense at a Pandora bracelet? You only ask him for a confrontation if the wrong verbiage is used. So what verbiage would constitute oral notification? And then you would have to also provide notification under 30.6 for hospitals, amusement parks, places of worship, and government meetings if you wanted to make them off limits, just like you do now. But under 30.6 now, it's a sign. Under 30.6, if SB 342 becomes law, you have to give oral notifications. So. Do hospitals have to apply that with, I don't know, somebody standing there saying, we, we do not allow the carry of handguns on the premises to everybody that comes in because that's going to get old. 
door greeters are expensive. Walmart tends to Walmart tends to have door greeters, but they're more of a security issue, uh, more of a security thing. Kind of like, well, we're kind of keeping an eye, make sure nobody's uh, going out the end or carrying something. Or there's somebody that needs a job and Walmart's providing them one, and it's more of a tax write-off than anything else. So really, a door greeter saying, you, uh, telling people you can't do something in here is not going to be received very well by property owners. So how would a hospital, an amusement park, a church, or other place of worship, and a government meeting go about it? Would they wait until you were inside and then when you were buying a ticket or getting a, or the preacher uh, goes to the podium? That'd be kind of inconvenient, both for them and the uh, license holder, or not license holder, but the carrier in hospitals. You're bleeding. You go to the door, you go inside and somebody stops you. You can't come in here. You got a gun and we don't allow carry in here. Uh Uh-oh, they just denied you treatment. Now they're open to the lawsuit. But if they don't give you that notification, but they give it to, say, your friend that's coming in with you, now somebody might have a case for discrimination. I don't know how well that would work. I'm not a lawyer, but you'd have an uneven application of the law, or they would have liabilities. And I'm not too sure that would really play well in a court system. So, you know, the whole oral notification thing's really causing me a lot of heartburn on this. There are other things in the bill that I really haven't had time to read over, but, you know, I'm really leaning towards this bill actually being a bad bill because for this bill to become law, the oral notification is going to have to be an either or. It's going to have to be an either or. Actually, it's going to have to be an inclusive or. Either one of them can trigger it, oral or written notification. And if they do that, well, you can almost guarantee that nobody's really going to want this bill passed if they have a concealed handgun license. Any bill that touches 30 out 6 is dead as far as, as, far as anybody uh, that has any kind of political clout it, understands. And this bill is kind of a, well, we're going to mess with 30 out 6 but we're going to make it harder for them to do it. No, because the legislature is not going to do that. In order to get this bill passed, you're going to have to change that. And that's not a good idea. Keep 30 out 6 untouched. We'll deal with improving that later. But this is the wrong way to do it. Now, like I said, I'm trying to keep this episode short. I want to try to wrap this up. Um, when I did this episode, I said, well, I want to get this in in under 30 minutes, and it's starting to look like that's not going to happen. So I'm going to end talking about SB 342 there, and that's also going to serve as a legislative update. I'm going to play the contact promo, which is unchanged. Well, not promo, but audio clip. I want to play that, and you can tell me after this, you'll know where to send an email to let me know if you like the other two. With that said, here's the contact. If you want to contact the podcast, please send an email to Aaron at gunrightsintexas.com. Or you can leave a comment on the webpage, which is gunrightsintexas.com. However, if you want to leave a voicemail and be featured on the show, then please do so by dialing 409 292 6736. With that, we're back for the news segment. We have just a few stories this time. I'm wanting to say we have around five. It's been a while since I did this this morning. So let's go ahead and move in. We have one story in the def- in defense of self and others category. Border Patrol agents in Texas were recently involved in a shooting that left one suspect dead. The suspect was shot after agents found and then confiscated drugs, after which they were fired upon while looking for smugglers. Agents returned fire, and the alleged drug smuggler was hit. He later died at the Star County Hospital. Now, here's a, here's a help, helpful hint to uh, drug smugglers. If you don't want to die, don't shoot at federal agents. Yeah, I know I kind of slowed down and changed my voice a little, but that's the hint. Don't shoot at federal agents if you don't want to die. That applies to drug smugglers and pretty much everybody else. In fact, don't shoot at cops or anyone else if you don't want to get shot back at. Then we have politics. Oh, boy. The political news, which is kind of what this show is, show is about, isn't what I enjoy. Mostly because most of the political news is anti-gun. So let's take a look at the political news, shall we? The Houston Chronicle is crying blood in the streets and all that over open carry. Not because it passed, but because they have decided it will pass. That's a good sign. It really is. 
if the anti-gun papers are already saying, hey, it's going to pass, but it's going to be bad, so let's try to limit it, we might get something passed, even with Corey Watkins and uh, his little associates causing all the problems that they want. Although he's going to be back to try again on the 29th of this month, if I'm not mistaken. Somebody had mentioned that somewhere, but I don't remember where. Speaking of Corey Watkins, he's in the second story we have. Corey Watkins and company made the news again, but this time it was on Al Jazeera America. Some of you may be wondering, wait a minute, Al Jazeera, isn't that the, uh, isn't that the news network that internationally is kind of pro-Islamic extremist? Yeah, they like to play a lot of the Islamic extremist videos, and they're kind of anti-American, but they still have an American uh, sub-network. Well, they play it up as a racial story in the end, but the story is really about Corey Watkins and open carry Tarrant County with their armed cop watch activities that, well, these activities are causing some pretty tense situations with police, at least in Arlington. It's kind of like a, kind of like a cobra and a mongoose. The cobra will probably lose in most, if not all, cases. But the mongoose isn't exactly going to be friendly about how he goes about it because, well, he knows that that cobra can hurt or kill him. Well, we also have a story in the miscellaneous category. we got two there, so we do have five stories. In a story that shows how critical it is to practice gun safety, a 10-year-old North Texas girl was shot in the hand by her father. Now, the situation is that the father was showing friends the handgun when it was discharged. The bullet penetrated the wall before striking the 10-year-old on the other side. Hmm, this is all a bad situation, and you know what? There are four rules to gun safety, and if only one of them had been followed, this would not have happened. That's right, one of the rules would have prevented this. But obviously, somebody had the booger hook on the bang switch. Somebody was pointing the gun in a direction that uh, had something they did not want to shoot. They, did, they were not sure of the target that the gun was pointed at or what was beyond that target. Do I need to go on? Because there's only one left. They did not treat the gun as if it was loaded, because obviously it was. This just irritates me. This really irritates me when people do something like this, because this does not do anybody any good other than the gun banners. They file that away, and they, they prance it around for decades. But hey, on a brighter note, we do have an update on TV meteorologist Patrick Crawford, who we have covered two or three times before in the new segment. You know, Mr. Crawford was shot by an unknown party outside the news station that he works at on December 17th, 2014. Mr. Crawford has returned to work and even made a joke on air that he timed his return to coincide with the good weather. Officials are still looking for the attacker and a reward for tips leading to the attacker's arrest is out there. You know what? I'm just going to leave the news there and hopefully this will be under the 35 minute mark. I'm not entirely sure if it will make it under that mark. But we'll let it go and see if it does. In fact, I could flip over and look at the recorder and see how long it's been, but that really doesn't cover it that well. So let me say I would like to thank Charles Cotton, Alice Tripp, Tara Micah. They are the they are the three that I know that are working for us real hard. It, they are uh, they are either dedicated dedicated either due to their income in Tara and Alice's world or they're a lifelong dedicated uh, advocate for gun rights as they are with Charles. And I am certain that in order to get a job as the NRA uh, state lobbyist, you have to be pretty dedicated, like a lifelong dedication to gun rights. So I'm certain Tara Micah is. I have never spoke to her, but I can I can pretty comfortably say I'm certain she's a lifelong dedicated gun rights activist. And in Alice Tripp's case, I had the opportunity to speak to her and, well, Based on that conversation, you can hear one of the two conversations I've had with Alice. That would be in episode 10 of the Gun Rights in Texas podcast when it was the open carry report. But let me say, Alice Tripp, if she has been a lifelong dedicated gun rights activist, she is so dedicated that she might as well have been. I mean, it's her career and she's that good at it. Even though the legislature only meets one time every two years for just a few months, she works two years at a time to get stuff done. She's probably already working on the 2017 session because she is that dedicated. And Charles, well, you've seen, you've heard him on the podcast. You know that he is active in gun rights and you know that he is a very dedicated individual. You know, it's not his career, but he does have other, uh, he does, 
he might as well do make it his career because he's that dedicated. When you get to dedication, those three are dedicated to getting gun rights uh, improved in Texas, and I'd like to thank them. I already have, and I'm making the episode longer than it needs to be, but I do want to say thank you for your dedication, and I do want to let everybody out there know that when you start answering the calls to action from the NRA, the TSRA, and even the Texas Firearms Coalition, which Charles uh, runs, you have my thanks for that too. With that said, I'm going to hit the sign-off music, so please. Stay safe and carry responsibly. Thank you for listening to the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. Please leave a review on iTunes or send feedback to the host. Your input will be used to improve the show. Stay safe and please carry responsibly.